So I've been out on an adventure today with uh, Dan Lowe and, and Rick. Rick? Crawford. Crawford, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and we just got back, and Dan was showing us how to interpret some monuments, Spanish monuments and things like that, but Rick's got one heck of a story to tell, and I've twisted his arm, and he's going to tell it. But also, Rick has his own uh, YouTube channel. So first, real quick, tell us how we can see your videos on YouTube, and then tell me this story. Well, the channel on YouTube is Treasure Exploration and Research. Uh, I started out as Napa, which was a petroglyph channel, and that just wasn't interesting enough. So I had I got another channel going to and to to put the treasure stories in, and then keep it separate from some of the Native American stuff, and because some of the Native American people don't get too excited about the treasure stories. So anyway, uh, I like to do that, and and this story we're going to talk about today ties into the tr the Spanish. Uh, we were just at this Spanish site looking at some monuments, and um, this story also is the first treasure story that I ever came across as a kid. It's what got me interested in the history and and uh, tre treasure stories, and uh, it's also the story that where I met Dan, the Llewellyn Harris. In pursuing the Llewellyn Harris history, I got on a forum which was. Uh, what was that? The Treasures of Utah. U Treasures of Utah site looking for some family members I was trying to track down and I actually found a granddaughter of Llewell <coughs> Llewellyn Harris on that site and was able to put together some of my research and that's how I met Dan and that's kind of but that was kind of that's been probably 10 years ago. A little longer I think. Or maybe longer yeah. and um but that was towards the end of my research on Llewellyn Harris. I'm getting to where I've, I've kind of got the beginning and an end to this treasure story. We found out where the treasure came from, pretty much where it ended up, and we've even come across a map that shows the location, if you can interpret the map. So, I, do you want me to just go right into cool. it? Or, so, okay. Yeah, man, you got first, me, so let's hear it. Okay. First tell the people who Llewellyn Harris is. Okay, and, yeah. right. Well, Llewellyn Harris was a, uh, a Welsh pioneer. He came over as a young man on a boat from Wales. He was born in 1832. Uh, his mother died shortly after they arrived from Wales, and he was an orphan on the streets of New York for several years. He sold newspapers, and he had a rough life uh, on the streets, but he was became really savvy and learned to survive, and, and he started west. He actually part way across the plains. He took up with a group of Indians, and he actually stayed with the Plains Indians for two years uh, because they had. He was trying to see. They had some words that he thought were Welsh, and he had learned about Prince Madoc from his lineage. His mother had told him that he was related to Prince Madoc, and they told him about a group of people coming to America or to this country years ago before Columbus, and. So he had, in the back of his mind, he was always looking for these Welsh, um, his Welsh family members that had taken off. And so he learned, uh, he had a gift for, for native languages because he learned uh, the Indian language really fast. Subsequently, he got tired of living with the Indians and when a pioneer train came through, he joined the train and, and came to Utah. And he, he uh, ended up marrying a, a gal and he was sent down to southern Utah to St. George area where he lived and had a homestead and Llewellyn Harris was sent to the uh, Indians in northern Arizona and New Mexico and he quickly learned the language and one of the things that he did to get right into this treasure story how it all started was he I'm going to go tell this real quick, I'm going to backtrack, but he went, uh, he performed a great miracle. The Indians were all dying from smallpox that they had contracted from the Spanish, and he went in there and, and they were all healed. As amazing as that sounds, uh, that's part of the, if you go to the Zuni tribe today, they still remember Llewellyn Harris and they still remember that when he saved their tribe. He also, as a result of that, they offered him a map, and it, it was a map, and they, he, they said this was to a white man's treasure, 
and they said, you know, this treasure caused our families much grief because we were enslaved in the mines of the Spanish. And um, he probably knew more, was told more history than that. But they gave him this map and they said, this will lead you to the treasure. And he said, well, I'm not doing this for treasure. And they said, well, we're still giving it to you because we don't know what to do with it. And you're a good man and you will find something good to do with it. So he took that map, which was on buckskin, and he sewed it on the back inside of a, in the lining of his leather coat that he always wore. And he, he wore that around throughout his mission to many of the different tribes. And after his mission, he settled, he moved to Escalante. And immediately after moving there, he took his son-in-law, or he took his uh, brother-in-law and another man, and they went out onto the 50 Mile Mountain, the Caparowitz Plateau, and to the south end and started running cattle. And everybody in the area always wondered how this man, Llewellyn Harris, who had been living over in St. George area, went on a mission to the Indians and then all of a sudden just moved to Escalante and then went right out and started running cattle on the Caparowitz Plateau. So now I'm going to backtrack to where I learned about the story when I was 12 years old. And we had two old timers, uh, Leo Wilson and uh, trying to think of the Wayne Banks. And Leo Wilson had lived in Escalante his entire life, and he told us this treasure story, and I was just a young 12-year-old kid, so it was really fascinating to me. He said that uh, Llewellyn Harris came to town, he was a famous missionary to the Indians, and that his children and him, or his family, went out and looked for this lost Golden Jesus treasure. Somehow, you know, it filtered down and that he had was looking for this treasure that the Indians had told him about. And Leo Wilson, who was who ran sheep and, and cattle out in that country, knew it really well. And so he was able to give us some details and tell where Llewellyn Harris's name was actually written in several places. Once in Harris Wash, twice on the Kaparowitz, one by Window Wind Arch, another one down by Spencer's Point. And then there was another signature I have not been to off towards uh, the Holen Rock somewhere. And I've been to all those signature sites in my search, except for the one off. I haven't walked around and climbed off the ledges to see where it is. But So I started, me and my dad, we started going to some of these areas and trying to find this treasure and follow these clues. And after I graduated from high school, I went to Brigham Young University, my first year of education, secondary education, and BYU has a spectacular research library. And growing up, I'd learned how to do genealogy and search the church records with my family. And so I went into the microfilm and looked up Llewellyn Harris. And I started finding all these amazing stories and experiences from his life. Of course, there wasn't anything in there about treasure. Um, but I was able to find enough leads that I was able to determine to find another family in Cedar City that I talk, I've talked to throughout the years and they've given me some additional details about his life. Um, coming full circle, it wasn't until 15 years ago, well, let, let, me, let me backtrack a little bit. Uh, I read, a, read one of the books that George A. Thompson wrote, Lost Treasures on the Old Spanish Trail. And it had a reference to this same story. It was a little bit the lost, the lost golden Jesus, the lost story. Golden Jesus story. Plateau, yeah. yep. That's right. And it's a little bit stretched. I, you know, I got to give George Thompson credit that I he did a lot of research and he traveled to do his research, kind of like Louis L'Amour. You know, he his books were always backed up, even though they were fiction, or they were backed up by a lot of historical facts. And George Thompson was the same way. So I started writing letters back and forth to him. And he wrote me a letter, and I've got several letters from him. And one of them said, he said, you know, I wouldn't put much stock in that story, but where there's smoke, there's fire. He says, I've come across that story from se several different places. And he says, so there's got to be something to it. Well, my, my grandma, Hall, was born and raised in Kanab. And so one day I, I was visiting with her, 
And she, and I started asking her about Canab, and somehow that treasure story came up. And she says, I don't know anything about the treasure story, but she said, when I was a little girl in Canab, the Indians, when times were tough, would come into Canab and trade little silver uh, bars and Spanish items, things that we knew were Spanish, to us for food. And she said, we would have, you know, traded more things for them, but we didn't really have that much either. You know, food was more valuable than silver, and you couldn't eat it, you know, during the winter. And she said, but she said that that was true, that the Indians did bring things in that they, so that tied me into this treasure cave that supposedly held this treasure. In George A. Thompson's book, he, he mentioned that this lost, Golden Jesus treasure started in the Virgin River and after there was an Indian revolt the Padre and his soldiers took whatever they could and fled trying to get along the straight cliffs and back across the crossing of the fathers and apparently there was a battle and there are some areas that are called Surprise Canyon and Last Chance just before the next canyon which is where the crossing was which is today called Padre Bay, and Padre Butte sits above Padre Bay. So that's where the crossing was. So suppo apparently the Indians surprised them, and then this was their last chance to make the cut to get down, and somehow they got probably got cut off and got pushed up onto Grand Bench because a hundred and something years later, out on Grand Bench, when Llewellyn Harris was looking out there, he found his, his son-in-law, um, Hiram C. Bailey found burrow bones and pack saddles of Spanish burrows and pack saddles out on the plateau. Mm. My dad and, our, and I, in our research, we learned that if they were trying to get to the crossing of the fathers, on that topography level, you had to go up and around a big rock to get down to the crossing. If you missed that elevation or got pushed up onto the next topography line, it would suck you right up onto Grand Bench where their burrow bones and pack saddles were found. And I remember many times as a kid doing that trip out there with my dad. It was a beast. One time he took an old, um, what were those little, tote goat. tote goat. Tote goat and went out there and we ran out of gas way out there and we had to push it all the way back to the truck. I was about ready to leave it. And, uh, but we went out there and I, one of these days I'd like to go out there with a metal detector because I've never metal detected that where those burrow bones and pack saddles were found. So you know where that area yeah. is? Yeah. And I know that if there was something on them, it didn't go very far because once some burrows are dead, it's, it's you know, whatever was on them is not going to be put on another burrow. It most likely was thrown in a ditch by the Indians, you know, or the Spanish. But anyway, somewhere in that area where they were ambushed, they cached this treasure in a cave. And this is the same story that I heard from Leo Wilson that I read about in uh, uh, George A. Thompson's book. George A. Thompson had it on the south end of the plateau, and I know, or on the north end of the plateau, and I know it was on the south end because that's where his name is, and that's where he was, Llewellyn Harris was looking for the treasure. Um, so I wanted to know where the treasure originated, and I got on I got online to try to track down some leads, and I came across the Treasures of Utah site, and I put a post on there for I joined the site and put a post on there, and said, "Does anybody know anybody related to Llewellyn Harris?" And a little bit later, it wasn't very long, I got a PM personal message from one of his great granddaughters, said, "Hey, I'm a." I'm, I'm a relative of Llewellyn Harris. Can you, what do you know about him? And I was like, you tell me what you know and I'll tell you what I know. You know, it was one of those things. And, and that's how I met, met Dan too. He kind of jumped in there and, and, and we talked back and forth. And, and uh, me and Dan took a trip down to visit with, I'm not gonna mention her name because uh, I haven't talked to her to see if it's get permission. But we went down there and visited with her and she's a great gal, nice lady. And, so, so I want to stop you real quick. Don't yep. remember where you was at. Yep. Because, you know, those old forums, they aren't used anymore. The, the Treasures of Utah, Ancient Lost Treasures. There are a lot of great stories. Oh, you bet. Things. We got dozens and dozens of people signing up for it every month. And nobody said Nobody posts anything. Yeah. 
yeah, there's a lot of great information on them old forums. So yep. for those that don't know about them forums, you need to go look them up, go through all the backlogs of all the posts with them because there's a lot of great information yep. back on them. Okay. And there's some information about this story on there that I probably won't remember to tell you on this too. But anyway, me and Dan went up. We we'd become friends, and we went up to visit with his great granddaughter, and and she said. We've got a map in the family somewhere. My mom gave me a copy, but I don't know where it is. And she ran around the house for an hour looking for it and couldn't find it. And then she came back and she said, but what we're looking for is his signature in 1889. And of course, I'd brought all my files with me to her house. And she was sitting, we were at the bar, sitting there and sipping a Coke or some water or something. And she was on the other side and I just took a picture out of the file and flopped it down in front of her like that. And she just went white. She about tipped over. There was the picture, L. Harris, 1889, that the whole family has been looking for really? for, for years. And, um, and so we planned a trip, her, her husband and, and I, and even and Dan was invited if he wanted to go. But anyway, we, were, we had a big trip planned. We're, uh, her husband has horses. We we're going to go down and go up the trail and ride out onto that area because it's really inaccessible in any other way other than horseback or helicopter now and a week before we had planned the trip a serious serious rainstorm dumped three or four inches of rain out on the road and just washed out every culvert all the way out on the desert I mean it was bad I mean the, you people were stranded out there for two weeks while the county was trying to repair the roads and get them out so it canceled our trip and since that time we've just life and everything we just never have made it out there again so they had some information on that area where that, uh, where he carved his name in that yep. cave. They was looking for that because they had some information on there. And his name is, it's in a cave, and, and but the cave is a hard bottom cave. It's not like you could bury anything in there. But what's interesting is it was partially rocked up. And, it, and so it's like at one time it might have been all rocked up, but I think Llewellyn Harris found it. And I think that he took it out because Anybody else that goes up there exploring, running cattle is going to see that, find that cave. I think he took it out and buried it somewhere nearby. Mm. I don't think and he. They, they know where. I think they have information about where he put it in relation to where that cave is. That's just my, what I'm surmising. Um, Why don't we call her up and ask her? Well, I, we've, I've talked to her quite a few times and, you know, I still want to see that map because just a few years ago, Dan called me, and he said, "I think I've found I found a map, and I want to send it to you. You might know what it is." And he didn't know. He said, "Jacob Hamlin found this map on a black slate rock somewhere outside of Kanab." And he sent me a picture on the phone. And the second, I mean, the second I saw it, I said, "That's the Llewellyn Harris treasure map." Huh? And it was a it was not just a treasure map, and 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 the X on the map was exactly where that cave was. Really? Exactly. And what this map was, was a star map that showed three constellations. And it, it, in my mind, now all of a sudden I understood what those rock piles that I found on the ground out in that country were. Those rock piles were the physical evidence of those constellations on the ground hmm. but they did match up pretty nice yeah they, they I mean there's no doubt whatsoever but guess where I got the map where no you have to guess I have no idea he doesn't even know where he got it I don't know but um, I, don't know I, I think it. it's probably the same map that Pat uh, that, uh, that you almost said her name that she has that Llewellyn's granddaughter Maybe. has someone sent it to me I get stuff all the time, but I usually remember where it comes from. But so I do not remember who sent it to me. Supposedly, it was found upside down on the ground. It was an unusual black flat rock, and they flipped it over, and it had a map. So my, I think the Spanish left that as a <laughs> safety mechanism that if they lost the the other map, the one they were carrying with them, they could go back to that location, and that map would lead them to the way. 
The interesting thing is by looking at that star map and looking at the constellations, I, I found out that actually I knew that they deposited that treasure in November because that was the only time those constellations lined up in that mm. position. It, so that it put everything where it is. And by yeah. drawing a line on those constellations on the ground, you could pinpoint exactly where that X, they had a little house shaped thing with an X in the middle on the map. Very, very interesting. Probably could give him a copy of it because nobody would know where it was, you know, and even with me knowing where it was, I haven't been able to find it. So it's not like it's, I don't want people to go out there. It's actually in the Grand Staircase Monument. So you're not supposed to be out there digging or looking anyway. And um, then if it was found, they would take it away from you if they found out you had it anyway. So it's kind of, in a situation where it's kind of uh, it's really interesting, but I don't know there's how how you'd ever recover it, you know, without. So, so do you think time. it's do you think it's still in the same area, vicinity, or do you think Llewellyn Harris moved it, and the family now has the map to where he moved it? Maybe I don't I don't know maybe, that part of it. Maybe not the map, but the information. In verbal information. To, yeah. to get you. Uh -huh. I, th I think a lot of the treasure, the smaller stuff was taken by the Indians, but I think the, the actual golden Jesus, the cross, the crucifix was is probably still there. I think the Indians were afraid of that. And I think, I don't think Llewellyn Harris would have bothered that. I think that he might have taken some of the silver because not long after that, uh, well, 10 years later, he moved to Arizona and bought a, a farm down, a ranch down there, a nice ranch moved his family down there and bought some cattle and a ranch. So we obviously, in 10 years of, ran of running cattle on that area, accumulated either enough wealth to buy a nice ranch in Arizona and move down there, or he come up with some money from somewhere. Um, in my research, I backtracked. I, I, to verify the truthfulness of the story, I wanted to know where the treasure came from. And, and when I met Dan, he talked to me about a site down near St. George that is a Spanish site, and it ties into the Silver Reef, the Silver Reef area where the pioneers came in there, and they said that the Spanish had been mining in that area long before the white man discovered pure horn silver in sandstone. There was evidence that the Spanish had been mining there. Mm. Yeah, it was more of a, I, I don't know, I'd classify it more of a Jesuit site, but. Possibly, yeah. It wouldn't be uncommon to find the same symbolism with the Spanish, but right. it's actually a pretty unique site. And we kept it quiet for years, and we still keep it quiet, but as time goes on, more people find out about it. Now it seems everybody and their dog knows about it, but the cool thing is they, they don't know what to do with it. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> It's just the uh, riding on the rocks. When we first went down there, I had a buddy that lived just right there, and, and we put him on it, and we told him, you, you got to follow the knife, follow the knife. And uh, said, you're going to run into a big old red ledge, and there's going to be holes everywhere. Because that's where the mentality stopped. Uh, that's where they have stopped in the past. They simply follow the direction, they hit a rock wall, a cliff, they dig holes all over the place. Their imagination goes no further. I sent my buddy over there and I told him, when you get to all them holes, put your thinking cap on. I said, you've got what it takes. And he, he's pretty sharp. He's just one of those guys that thinks outside the box. I mean, he's caught me many times and, and on different projects and pointed out things that I never noticed, but sure enough, he goes over there and he starts looking around and he finds the next set of instructions. It's, a, it's actually a map hmm. carved on the rock. Pretty cool. And this is, these people have known about the first panel for 150 years and nobody ever got past that. He goes there, he finds the second panel, follows it, finds the third panel, and to a fourth panel. Hmm. And since then I've had another friend that found another site that may be related to the site. We, we think we found the mining area. Right. 
but it's it's an interesting sight, and that's one of the things that drew me into this uh, Llewellyn Harris story. It was just the whole idea that it might have come from there. Mm. And uh, the other reason, of course, is if you read through some of Llewellyn Harris's books and so forth, uh, what was that you? The Welsh. It's a journal. That was written by one of his granddaughters. Well, it wasn't so much his mention of Prince Maddock. You know, everybody's heard of Prince Maddock, and, you know, they, they think that's so cool, and it is, but they don't understand is Prince Maddock, he was following his ancestors, a very old trail. And Llewellyn Harris even made a comment about that, something to do with Montezuma, that Montezuma was descent yes. of the Welsh. Yes. See, and the people that Montezuma was talking about are my ancestors, mm. direct lineage. They used to rule the Toltec. <laughs> I, I know it sounds crazy. Don't don't throw rocks. At me. <laughs> well, what, what's interesting about Llewellyn Harris when he went to the Hopi and to the Zuni and to the all those tribes down oh. there? He had they had Welsh words. He recognized some of the, really? one of the reasons he picked up their languages so quick is they had mannerisms and words that were Welsh. And he actually wrote a letter to Brigham Young that about that. And there was a little investigation from the church and stuff and they didn't inconclusive evidence. But when you have somebody that has a gift of languages who was born and raised in Wales and now is among a group of peoples and understands their mannerisms and their languages, he knows better than anybody that yeah. That, it's, that something's there. You see, this whole thing just ties right in, which I've done on previous uh, interviews, it ties right back into the uh, Tucson Lead Crosses. Mm. Because you had the Welsh coming, you had the Roman colonies, in fact I think they were actually in conjunction at one point, um, but I think it finally got to the point where the Welsh just weren't going to put up with it anymore. And uh, they ended up separating from the typical Roman colonies. But I, I actually traced uh, Llewellyn Harris's genealogy back also to see if he tied into that same uh, line of Welsh kings right. that had been coming here, and he does. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just interesting as hell. It's <laughs> this. This has gone full circle, you know. And that's the thing about these treasure stories and a lot of this history is. If you dig into it enough, pretty soon all a lot of crossroads. You get a lot of things come together in one spot, and it makes it interesting, and it also solves some of the mystery uh, about it. Um, but the the thing I love about the Llewellyn Harris stories, I heard first one I heard about as a kid that got me involved in it. We've got the beginning. We know where the treasure came from. We have a map. We have eyewitnesses on the ground as as family, his granddaughters, and the, the the Zuni legends, the Sunni stories that he was there and had healed him and that they could give him some. They don't tell you what they gave him, but they told they told that they gave him something in return that they felt like he should have. And, and so it's, you know, the research has come full circle even though we haven't found the treasure. I'm confident that it's there or some something's there still. So the bottom line, if somebody made the story up, Damn, they're good. Yeah, <laughs> especially since I've been chasing this for 40 years, and all these other links have come in. And well, it's just the more the more years that passes, the more I understand that you know often the truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's some cool things out there that's happened in the past, and the whole Llewellyn Harris story is just another one of the evidences that backs that up and supports the things that we've been studying for years. What's cool about it with that map, that star map, to me confirms that those monuments that we're, we were at today, just because I know those monuments on the ground are the monuments on that map that you sent me, that, and they were accurate, you know, they're accurate. And so that makes me think that there's something to these other monuments that we're, we're missing some detail, you know, some history, some waybill, some so you final. You don't think it's just a trail going through the lava field? Uh, no, I don't think that those incidental smaller square ones and all that have anything to do with a trail. That's an interesting sight. Yeah. So I, I'm not smart enough on this story to, to know what to ask you, but I do want to say for the ending of this, man, Rick, thank you for sharing no, your... You're welcome. 30, 40 years of research with us. 
on, on that, you know, I've heard the story of the lost golden Jesus and on the Kapar what's plateau didn't know much about it and you've put more into detail man and i appreciate you sharing with that that with us and and with that said that's a wrap and go visit rick's website <laughs> or, or go visit rick's youtube channel <laughs> you got anything else you want to add to it um that I just the research the research is ongoing and if you have any information give me a holler you know and and uh we're following leads, but we, we've got the whole thing kind of tied up, but uh, it would be nice to see what was, you know, it would actually be nice to find something, have his family, you know, go in there and find something. So you think he, Llewellyn Harris, did find... Oh, I'm confident... That he left, you think he left the Golden Jesus there, yes. possibly moved it. The family knows, got information that it was moved, possibly. If, if they can find what they're looking for. Yeah, the family has confirmed that they, he didn't take some. That some things were not taken, and but I think they know that it, that that's what gave him his start with his ranch. And I, but I think that they know there's some something still there. Uh -huh. And um, the Indians didn't touch it because they were really superstitious about it. And it was only during really hard times they would even bring things into trade because even the Zunis when they gave him the map they said that they that you know it was a white man's treasure and they felt like it was cursed because it, their because of their people had died at the hands of the yeah. Spanish to produce this you know many tribes in that area had were involved in this not just the Zuni so anyway yeah if you know anything or know anybody that has heard any other details about this story the Golden Jesus I'd like to hear about it Rick so Thank you. You bet.